grab a Bible, open it up to Psalm 18. Psalm 18. As you're turning there, let me remind you, this coming Saturday is the Apologetics Conference. Every year we host this great event. Tim Barnett is coming. Tim works for an organization called Stand to Reason, uh, the same one that Alan Schleeman works for that we've brought in the last couple of years. And Tim's coming in and is doing some incredible sessions for us. Uh, doors open at 8.30 on Saturday. We'd love to see you there. Register online. It's $10 for the whole day. That includes lunch. And child care is available. It's $5 per child. Uh, so we'd love to see you at that. Register online. That helps us out. If not, you can do all that at the door. We'll happily uh, help get you set up then. At the end of King David's life, he sings a song of victory. He looks back on his entire life and he celebrates everything that God has done in his life and through him for the sake of Israel. And that song is in 2 Samuel chapter 22. This is a looking back on a, a long life, a successful life, and all he can do is sing. And this song would have likely been written while David is on his deathbed because the very next verse, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1, begins by saying, these are the final words of David, and within a chapter, David is dead. And this song of victory in 2 Samuel 22 is repeated verbatim in Psalm 18. It is the only psalm to be repeated word for word anywhere else in the Bible. Now, Psalm 18 is quite interesting. It's one of the longest. It's the fourth longest psalm, 50 verses long. But throughout this psalm, David utilizes a brilliant literary device known as a chiasm. A chiastic structure is one that lays out a series of points, then it will repeat those same points, but in reverse order. So think A, B, C, C, B, A. So that's what he does in these sections as he walks through this psalm. And since the outline is so helpful for us to understand the psalm, we're gonna put the outline on the screen and leave the whole thing up the entire time. So you note takers who are going to heaven because that's what we know, you've got it easy today. You can just look at it and, and put it all there together. And as he walks through these great sections, reflecting on his life, and all that God has done, David will highlight six characteristics of the God to whom he sings his final psalm. Now he will open and close this section, this, this psalm with sections of praise. He will bookend it with praise and he'll talk about deliverance and how he's been rescued from God's perspective and from his own perspective. In the heart of it, he will explain why it is that God has done this great work in his life from God's perspective and from his own. So let's begin with David's opening. So here's the first characteristic. Number one, God is worthy. Let's go to Psalm 18, verse one. He said, I love you, O Yahweh, my strength. Yahweh is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon Yahweh who's worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. There have been numerous songs over the years written to Psalm 18 and if you grew up in church like I did, you recognize those words and you read them in the tone of that song and you even want to clap twice at the right point. He opens with, I love you, O Yahweh. What a statement for him to open with. Let's remind ourselves that King David is one of the manliest men to ever live. King David fought and killed bears and lions as a child. That's fairly rare. He killed Goliath when he was 17. He's won military victories one after another. He's tough. He is rugged. He is deadly. And as he addresses his God, the most important thing he can say is, I love you. This is a real man. 
one who is not void of emotion, but feels and expresses his affections. Now that particular word that he uses for love is used a number of times throughout the Old Testament, but in the form that it's in here is the only time it's ever used anywhere in the Bible. Every other time it's used in its other forms, it is used exclusively to refer to God's love for his people. But here, it's David's love for his God. So in response to God's overwhelming love and affection for him, David responds and says, I love you too. Like you have loved me, I now love you. It's a word that expresses deep feelings and tender compassion. Is that the kind of feeling you have toward God? I mean, we often say things like we want to honor God and we want to worship God, we want to obey God, and all of those are right and good and very biblical. But maybe more often we should express, I love him. And then he calls God his strength, which introduces us to the theme of the entire psalm. God's strength that strengthens David, giving David the strength to defeat his enemies. That's the whole point of Psalm 18. And in verse two, David expands on that and he uses seven military metaphors in a row to refer to God. God is David's rock, his fortress, his deliverer, his refuge, his shield, his horn of salvation. A horn is a symbol of strength and he is his stronghold. In fact, twice here, David will call God his rock. And then he does again in verse 31 and again in verse 46. But here in verse two, twice he says, God is my rock, and he uses two different words for rock. This is like saying, God is my rock, God is my stone, God is my boulder, God is my mountain. There aren't enough words for David to use to describe how great God is. And this idea that God is our rock has two connotations to it. First, God gives a firm place to stand. He's a rock. David will use imagery throughout the psalm, uh, verse 19, verse 33, verse 36, verse 39, all talking about how David has a firm place to stand. As his life had its ups and downs, his life had some successes and some failures, God is the constant, stable force of his life. We understand this, don't we? The economy goes up and down. Sometimes things go well, sometimes they don't. Relationships explode. People betray, jobs get lost. Life's a roller coaster. And as everything around us continues to shift, we need something firm to stand upon. We need a rock that doesn't move. You have one, and it's your God. But this image of a rock has a second connotation to it. Life is found in the shade of a rock. David lives in an arid, dry place where the sun unrelentingly burns up all the life. And if you've ever been in a desert region, you've seen this firsthand. But if you're in that desert region and you go to large rocks in the shade of those large rocks, you'll find plants. You'll find animals finding relief from the sun. You will sometimes even find pools of water. So not only has God a firm place to stand, He's the guard who shields us from certain death and provides abundant life. And verse three serves as a bit of a summary statement. I call upon Yahweh, he's worthy to be praised. I'm saved from my enemies. We declare our love for God, how great he is because he's worthy of all of our praise. Number two, God is powerful. Go to verse four. The cords of death encompassed me, and the torrents of vileness terrified me. The cords of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. So do you see what David's doing with the the poetic repetition? Death is coming after him. Death is chasing him down to take him out. It's as if he personifies death itself. In fact, in ancient cultures, death was deified. The Greek god Hades is the God over death. 
Because the only way they could process the, the universal power of death, I mean, no one escapes it, right? It holds sway over all. The only way they could understand that was to worship it. So what's the solution? To the unrelenting power of the force of death that chases us all. Verse six. In my distress, I called upon Yahweh and cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry for help came before him. My cry for help before him came into his ears. David's almost dismissive of death. Yeah, death is scary. But I just cry out to God and all that goes away. He hears me. It's all fine. When John Wesley, one of the preachers in the era known as the Great Awakening, he was asked at one point, why do you think Christianity is spreading so rapidly? And he said, and I quote, our people die well. And this is why we die well. What follows is an epic description of the God who hears him when he prays. The God who erases the fear of death. Look at verse seven. Then the earth shook and quaked and the foundations of the mountains were trembling and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his, out of his nostrils and fire from his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens and came down with thick darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew and he sped upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, his canopy around him, darkness of waters, thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him passed his thick clouds, hailstones and coals of fire. Yahweh also thundered in the heavens and the Most High gave forth his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered them and lightning flashes in abundance and threw them into confusion. Then the channels of water appeared and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Yahweh, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. That really doesn't depict God as an old man with a long gray beard now, does it? This is the warrior God who defeats all of his enemies. And this description is full of images from the natural world. There's earthquakes. It seems like there's volcanic activity. There's hurricane force, winds and storms. And it's filled with Old Testament language. David knows his Bible quite well. Verses 7 to 11 is language borrowed from Mount Sinai. As Moses is on the top receiving the Ten Commandments, God descends on the top of the mountain with smoke and thunder and lightning, and it terrifies the Israelites to the point that they tell Moses, don't let God speak to us anymore because he's going to kill us. You go talk to him and come tell us what he said. Verses 12, 13, and 14 are language from the conquest of Canaan by ancient Israel as God would show up in all the great battles in Joshua and Judges, and sometimes God would even fight their battles for them. God would send giant hailstones down from heaven and kill more of the enemy than Israel even killed. And then verse 15 is language from the parting of the Red Sea. You know, when Israel was rescued by God from their slavery in Egypt, he did so by unleashing a series of plagues against Egypt. And God did that not merely to rescue his people from Egypt. He did that to prove to the world that Yahweh defeats even the false gods of Egypt. Same thing's going on here. Verses nine and 10, the language is of God riding in on the clouds with a storm. Baal, the wicked false god of Canaan, was their storm god, and his title was rider on the clouds. Verse 15, the language of the the channels of the sea. It's an indictment against El, who was the Canaanite high god whose throne was said to be at the headwaters of the sea. What's David doing? All these scary things that you've decided are gods, these powerful forces in the world, 
my God rules them all. What a helpful reminder today. The things going on for you at work might be utterly terrifying. The things happening in your marriage or with your kids or in the economy or wars or with an illness, my God rules it all. He's in charge of all of this. We need not be afraid. Verses 16 through 19 are simply a thanksgiving that that's true. Look at verse 19. He brought me forth also into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. What a note of encouragement. He delights in his people. Number three, God is gracious. And now we're to the heart of the psalm where in two separate sections, David will explain why it is that God steps in to rescue him and to save him. This one is from David's point of view. Look at verse 20. Yahweh has re rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of Yahweh and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also blameless with him and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, Yahweh has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands before his eyes. You know, much of David's life, so righteous, so holy, the man after God's own heart, he genuinely cared about his walk with the Lord. He was faithful. He was obedient. But if you read through King David's life, over and above all of that righteousness and holiness and obedience, there's a giant smudge in the shape of a woman taking a bath. He commits adultery with her, has her husband killed to cover up the pregnancy. So how is it that David can look back on his life and say, God has done all of this work because I'm righteous, because my hands are clean. He isn't righteous. His hands aren't clean. We've seen this in other Psalms. We'll continue to see it in more to come. David at times comes across almost arrogant, almost self-righteous in sections like this. But we have to understand them in the context of David's relationship with God. How in the world could David use the word righteous to describe himself? Here's why. Because when Nathan the prophet came to confront David with his sin, David repented and sought the Lord's forgiveness. Read Psalm 51 sometime soon and see that repentance. So David is righteous, not because he's perfect, not at all. David is righteous because he is forgiven. And the same is true of you. The Bible says that those who are in Christ are fundamentally defined as saints, holy ones, righteous. But you aren't. You're not righteous. You're not a saint. I mean, you're a wretched sinner like the rest of us. But according to God, all those that he has placed in Christ absolutely are righteous because the righteousness of the perfect son of God has been credited to your account. Not because you're perfect, but because you're forgiven. God is gracious. And number four, God is faithful. So this is the explanation for David's deliverance, but it's from God's point of view. Look at verse 25. With the kind, you show yourself kind. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. With the pure, you show yourself pure. With the crooked, you show yourself astute. For you save an afflicted people, but eyes which are lifted up, you bring down. For you light my lamp. Yahweh my God illumines my darkness. For by you I can run upon a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. So why is it that God has done all this work in and through David's life? Because David is so awesome? No. Because God is the one who's so awesome. David opens this section with a very interesting series of statements. 
God's kind to those who are kind, blameless to the blameless, pure to the pure. To those who love God, they see God as pure and lovely. The kind see him as kind, the blameless do the same. Uh, But then he includes this last phrase, the end of verse 26, and with the crooked you show yourself astute. Well, what does that mean? Some translations put the word astute as the word torturous. So to the crooked, God, you're torturous. So does that mean that when God encounters people who are crooked, God's response is to outdo them and be even more crooked than they are? No. Have you ever noticed that there are some who obviously do not love God, but they tend to hate God? They're not neutral about him. There's a lot of violence and anger in their reaction when anyone talks about the Lord Jesus. Why is that? I mean, what is it that you could look at the life of Jesus and go, I hate him? See, a a Christian can read the Bible and declare with David, I love him. While the wicked can read that same Bible and vehemently hate him. This is why. God is astute. He outmaneuvers them. As they attempt to thwart God's plan, as they harm God's people, as they come up with their wicked schemes, God powerfully orchestrates even those things to be for the benefit and blessing of his people. They think they're clever. He is infinitely more so. God is faithful to his people. Verse 27, he saves them. Verse 28, he lights up their path so that they can flourish and succeed. Verse 29, he empowers them to overcome their enemy. So what's the explanation for David's success from God's vantage point? God is the explanation, which is exactly where David camps next. Number five, God is provider. Look at verse 30. As for God, his way is blameless. The word of Yahweh is tried. He's a shield to all who take refuge in him. For who is God but Yahweh? And who is a rock except our God? The God who girds me with strength and makes my way blameless. He makes my feet like hinds feet and sets me upon my high places. He trains my hands for battle so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You've also given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand upholds me and your gentleness makes me great. You enlarge my steps under me and my ankles have not given way. Well, now in this section, David is the warrior. This isn't talking about God up in the clouds. This is David's perspective on the streets, his perspective in the heat of the battle. And what you see is this ongoing back and forth God gave and I won. God gave strength. God strengthens my feet, sets me on the high places. God trains my hands for battle. God has given me his shield. And David takes all that God has given to him and he puts it to work. God did the strengthening. David has to do the fighting. And all the way down through verse 45, David will seemingly brag about all of his victories And all of the enemies, all the nations that will come and cower before him as their king. But he's not bragging. He's glorifying the God who made it possible. When I was in high school, my home preacher preached a sermon entitled Turtle on a Fence Post. It's based, I've learned since, on a book and a longtime political phrase and joke The premise is that driving along a road, he saw a turtle sitting on top of a fence post and came to the radical conclusion that turtle didn't get there on its own. Somebody had to put it there. Certainly true for us, isn't it? Listen, I hope genuinely that you are as successful as you can imagine. I hope all your hopes and dreams come true. I hope everything you touch turns to gold. But always remember this. You're a turtle on a fence post. You did not get there alone. You had a teacher who encouraged you in a certain direction. 
You had parents who sacrificed so much to give you all those opportunities. You had a boss early on that took an interest in you, whatever it might be. But above and beyond all of that, you have a ruling God over the universe who maneuvers and orchestrates to bring about all the good that has come into your life. God is provider. Number six, God is exalted. The end of the Psalm, verse 46, Yahweh lives and blessed be my rock and let the God of my salvation be lifted high. The God who executes vengeance for me and subdues people under me, who delivers me from my enemies, surely you lift me above those who rise up against me. You rescue me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you among the nations, O Yahweh, and I will sing praises to your name. He gives great salvation to his king and shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his seed forever. So David ends pretty much where he began. He's so overwhelmed by all that God has done for him that all that he can do is praise. God is to be blessed. God is to be praised. God is to be lifted up. God is to be exalted because God delivers. God raises up. God rescues. And oh, here's the good news. These acts of God aren't just for David. This great God is not just for Israel. Look at verse 49. Therefore I will give thanks to you among the nations, O Yahweh, and I will sing praises to your name. This God is God over all. This God doesn't limit himself to one particular people group. He welcomes people from every nation, every people, every tribe, every language, every background, every status, and how do we know that? Well, the Apostle Paul quotes Psalm 18, verse 49, and Romans chapter 15, verse 9, to remind us that the gospel of Jesus Christ has gone forth outside of Israel and is to be taken to the ends of the earth to announce salvation from this God is found in Jesus Christ alone. And that's hinted at at the end of verse 50. And he shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his seed forever. Loving kindness to his anointed is the Hebrew word Messiah. To David and his seed. Well, who is that seed? I mean, David has children. He has a bunch of them. Solomon will rise and sit on the throne after David dies. Well, in 2 Samuel chapter seven, God makes this promise to David that your seed will sit enthroned over my people for all eternity. Well, that's not Solomon. Solomon's been dead for a very long time. All of this points to Jesus, the ultimate son of David, who has come to save and rule over all things forever. So put that in the context of Psalm 18. As David looks back over his life and sings this song of victory, David is given all of these victories, not because David is so special. David is given all of these victories to prepare for even greater victories to come through David's greater son. These promises are not disconnected from us. They don't apply only to some bygone era about 3,000 years ago. They are as relevant for you today as they were for David when he wrote it. And perhaps maybe you already noticed the very fitting bookends of the psalm. Verse one opens with, I love Yahweh. And then he closes verse 50 with God loving him. Everything in David's life, everything in my life, everything in your life is bracketed, is bookended, is surrounded by the love of your great God. 
In the middle of the 18th century, a man was walking in a field in England. His name was Augustus Montague Top Lady. That's an epic name. Augustus Montague Top Lady. He was an Anglican minister. And while he was walking in the field, a violent storm blew up quickly and he was exposed standing in the middle of the field. He had nowhere to go. But in the distance, he saw a crop of rocks. In fact, we know the exact rocks. You can go ahead and put up the picture. That's the rock. He saw that and knew if I could get behind that rock, I would find shelter from the storm. Very Psalm 18-ish. And while he was sheltered up against that rock, he began to reflect on his faith. How good God had been to him. And while there, he penned one of the most famous Christian hymns in all of history. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. That is our hope. He is our rock. He is a firm place to stand. When everything else moves and gives way, he doesn't move. He is our rock, our shelter, the one in whose shadow we live. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you're our rock. You're our shelter. You're the firm place upon which we stand. When all else gives way, you never move. You are unchanging. We're reminded of the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when he said those who hear his teaching and don't obey it, it's like building a house on sand. It's so unstable and it moves and when the storm comes, the house is destroyed. But the wise dig down to the rock and they build their house there. They hear your word and they obey it. And then when the storm comes, because it always comes, their house stands because the rock never moves. Thank you that we hide in your shelter. You're our refuge. You're the rock that's big enough that in your shade there is life to be found. So thank you for the work of the Lord Jesus that saves sinners like us, that provides life in a world that kills every time. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray.